Good evening. I'm going to get to the point. Tonight I want to talk about commitment. And I'm getting to the point because when I sat down to try to write a lesson about commitment, I thought that commitment was an easy thing to define. It was something easy to see and recognize. And the more and more that I thought about and the more and more that I studied that I realized that commitment is really hard to recognize. Because there are a lot of things that are not commitment that from the outside eye look a whole lot like commitment. Think of involvement, being involved in something, participating in an action. That, from an outsider, looks like commitment. They don't know how often you do it. They don't know if you do it just because it's convenient or if you're actually committed. They don't know if it a, has a personal benefit factor or are there any external factors weighing in on why you are doing it. Involvement looks like commitment, but it's not quite. You see, commitment is a total pledge. It's 100% effort, 100% dedication. It is obligation. It is deep, it is unwavering, it has purpose. And involvement's none of those things. Involvement is participating when it's easy, participating when you have family in town and they expect you to do something, so you do it for them. Participation's about convenience or what you can get out of it or your own joy, your own satisfaction. Participation's about me. Commitment is about something else. I heard this illustration, it was a preacher illustration, and I'll be honest with you. After reading it, I felt a little weird inside. But I also think that it was a pretty good illustration to define the different difference between involvement and commitment. I want you to picture a plate of ham and eggs. Chicken was involved with that meal. Chicken participated in providing those eggs for that plate, but that chicken didn't sacrifice too much. It didn't put in the whole work or the effort. It wasn't 100% committed. Now, now, the pig, on the other hand, when it comes to a pig and a plate of ham and eggs, the pig was committed. The pig put 100% for self, 100 of itself into that meal. And that's how, for the rest of this lesson, I want to think about commitment and involvement. Because I think it's easy to be involved. I think it's easy to participate. I think it's easy to look like you're committed to an outside eye. But I don't think it's actually easy to get there, to get to the point where you are comfortable, where you're eager, where you are willing to being 100% committed, sacrificing every part of the self for something greater. And we see that throughout scripture. We see that there are different consequences and different rewards for people who are either committed or just merely participate. And we see when we look at the example that God has set for us, we're supposed to walk in his footsteps. And God didn't just merely participate in our own salvation. He was committed. It was 100% an act of selfless love, selfless love. And that's what we're supposed to mirror, what we're supposed to try to be, the type of commitment that we're supposed to have. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 18. We're going to be in only Acts chapter 18 tonight. We're going to look at a handful of verses. Some of those verses we're going to look at twice three times. Some of those verses we're going to divide up into multiple sections because they're trying to teach us multiple things. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 18. We're going to be looking at a man named Apollos. In Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. And he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I want to start there. I want to start with the way of God, the word of God. Moving from participation or involvement into commitment has to focus around the word of God. And to start off, we need to know that word of God. In verse 24, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man and competent in the scriptures. 
is a Jew from Alexandria. Alexandria being a significant center of learning and culture in the ancient world, suggesting that at the very least he was a well-educated man. But not only was he well-educated about the things of the world, he was well-educated in something in particular, the scriptures, God's word. So I want to start with the most obvious and the simplest and the most important, that moving from participation to commitment requires us to begin, like Apollos, with knowledge. We are called to immerse ourselves in scriptures. We are called to understand its breadth and its depth. We're called to understand what God says and what that means for us. Because there is no point, nor is it possible, for us to be committed if we do not know what we are committed to. In verse 25, we just read, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. He was fervent. He was accurate. And that brings us to our second idea, that we need to live in this word of God. Not only do we need to know it, knowing it is important. Knowing it is the basis, the foundation of everything we do, every step we take forward. But knowing it's not enough. There are a lot of people who are not committed to God who are not committed to his word, who are not committed to his mission, who know a whole lot about the Bible. There are a lot of people who probably know more about the Bible than anyone in this room who are not committed to God's word. So not only do we need to know it, we need to understand it. We need to understand the importance of highlighting the scriptures, of understanding what they mean, and how that influences our actions. We need to live by them. Apollos' passion his fervent nature indicated that not only he knew them, but he was touched by, he was influenced by, he lived by the words that he read. And then in verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. We need to share God's word, right? Not only do we need to know it, not only do we need to live by it, obey it, understand it, let it influence our every action and thought. But we need to share that message. Priscilla and Aquila, right? They observe Apollos' bold teaching. And they see him and they understand that this is something special, that this man is something special. Not only is he smart, not only does he live by God's word, he also is boldly going around preaching about Jesus a man he did not yet competently understand in the synagogues, trying to reach those who were lost. And yeah, they had to set him aside and teach him some things more clearly. But I think all of us could be set aside and taught a few things more clearly. There's always going to be something that we don't quite understand, something that we need to learn from. And that's not an excuse to not share. Not knowing something completely, not having the best grasp not knowing the answer to every single question, because the Bible's a big book. There is a lot in there. We're not going to know the answer to every single question that somebody could ask us, but we can't use that as an excuse to not share God's word. I want to back up. I want to look at verse 25 again. Because not only does moving from participation, from involvement, Commitment involves knowing God's word, involve revolving our life around God's word. It involves something out of us too. We have to be willing to grow. We have to be humble. In verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. And then we see in verse 26, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, we're not exactly told Apollos' reaction. We're not told how well he took it, but I think, I think if we continue reading, we'll realize that he took it pretty well. Now, he didn't lash out in anger. He didn't start criticizing or ridiculing, saying, what do you know? Who are you to tell me this? It appears as if he took it with humility. Despite his eloquence, despite his knowledge, he was open to receiving the teachings that Priscilla and Aquila were ready to give him. He demonstrated humility. He demonstrated the ability to grow. 
And you see in verse 26, pinpoints how he grew, right? Verse 26 tells us exactly who helped him grow. Priscilla and Aquila heard him and took him aside and explained. Spiritual growth isn't just about us. Spiritual growth isn't just about humility. Spiritual growth is about how we interact with others who are more knowledgeable than ourselves. It's a communal. It's community. It's about how we interact with those who are more mature in their faith than ourselves. And he took it well. And I'd like to say that every time in my life that somebody came up to me and asked if I would be willing for them to explain something to me more accurately, I would love to say that I took it great every single time. I'd love to say that I sat down happy and excited to be told how I was wrong or how I was lacking in knowledge. But, and I think everyone else in the room can relate to this, I am a human, and I am a human who sometimes has a little thing, this little three-letter word called an ego, might get a little proud at times. And despite trying to be humble, despite trying to learn from others, when it comes to the confrontation, when it comes to the time to actually get my feet in the mud and learn from those who are more mature than me, there have been times where I, I said, no, I'm good. What do I need to know? Now, maybe I didn't say that to their face, but those were the thoughts going on in my head. And I sat there and I smiled and I said, thank you. But in the back of my head, I was going, well, I'm right and they're wrong. I know I'm right because I thought it and I'm not wrong. And if I'm not wrong, I'm right. And that's silly. That's circular reasoning. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, it's what I think we as humans do often. We let our pride, we let our ego get in the way of our humility, getting in the way of how we are able to grow. Let's continue. In verse 27 and 28, so they sat him down. They explained the ways of God more accurately. And then in 27, it picks right up. And when he wished to cross the Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. He wished to cross to Achaia. He wanted to go. He wanted God to use him. Not only was he eloquent, not only was he knowledgeable, not only was he living by God's word, not only was he willing to sacrifice the self, his ego and his pride to learn more, not only was he willing to lean on those who are more knowledgeable than himself, but once he got that new knowledge, he wanted God to use him and that knowledge that he had been blessed with. He wanted to serve. He wanted to go where he knew that the need was. And that's a hard one. Because that's, that's commitment. He was willing to leave where he was comfortable, where things might have been easy, where he had settled down. And he wanted to be used elsewhere because he knew that's where the need was. Now, I'm not saying that every single one of us here tonight need to start packing our bags and traveling to Southeast Asia or Africa or somewhere across the globe. That's silly. Because if we all do that, there's nobody here. There are plenty of people here who need God's word. But he did go where he was needed. And sometimes where we're needed isn't more than just around the corner. And yet, it's hard to want to go around the corner sometimes. It's hard to go where we know that the need is, where we know that there are people who need us to help them understand God's love and who they are, because it's uncomfortable because I don't want to, because I'm comfortable, I like my schedule, I like my routine, I like my little life where I don't have to interact with people I don't know. And that's not commitment then, right? If we're only involved with God's word, if we're only involved with sharing God's message when it's convenient, when it fits into our schedules, where it doesn't make us feel a little uncomfortable, that's not commitment. That's participation, and lousy participation at that. And then at the end of verse 27, when he arrived, he greatly helped those 
who through grace had believed. So not only did he want to go to where the need was, once he got there, he started off by helping those by through grace had believed. He wanted to minister to and sacrifice for and work with other Christians, with other believers. Now, this wasn't his home community. This wasn't where he was from. And yet the moment he got down there on the foot, right, the moment he was surrounded by other believers, he wanted to help those people. He wanted to see to their needs. I think that one's not too difficult. And yet, so often I think we're blind to the needs of those around us, right? We know that we should be helping those in our Christian community. We know that we should be seeing their needs, but it's very, very easy. And again, confession, saying this from experience, it's very easy to say, yeah, I would gladly help the needs of those in my community, except for I don't know anybody who has any needs. Everybody I know is doing great. There's no need for me to sacrifice for anybody else because everybody else is happy and fine and dandy. And when I say that in the back of my head, I know it's not true. I know it's a lie, and yet it's a lie that's really easy to believe. It's a lie that's easy to believe because it doesn't require me to be committed. It's a lie that's easy to believe because it's convenient, it's easy, it's what I already wanted to hear. And then in verse 28, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Not only was he willing to go, was he eager to go to where God needed him. Not only once he got there, was he willing and ready and eager to sacrifice, to work with other believers, with other Christians. He got there, and he was ready to declare Jesus to all those who don't believe. And I think this is the hardest part of commitment. It's easy, error, it's easier, nothing is easy, at least not to me, but it's easier when they're strangers, right? When you're going around and you're trying to share Jesus with the waitress at the IHOP, with the clerk at the grocery store, and you know you're not going to see them again. If they reject me, it's fine, I'm not going to see them again, that's fine, that's easy. But I know a lot of people personally, and I'm assuming you do too, because you live in the same area that I do. Now, you know personally people who are not Christians, who do not have a relationship with God. They might not even believe that there is a God. And for me, the people I know personally who do not believe are the hardest people to minister to. Because I know i got to see them again. And I know that this conversation is going to be uncomfortable. I know it's not going to be easy. I know I don't want to do it. I am not eager to do it. And yet, we look at Apollos. We look at Jesus' time on earth. We look at the whole gospel narrative of salvation, right? And we know, or at least we should, be able to clearly understand that we are here for a specific reason, right? We are here on this earth for a specific reason. Because it would be easy. It would be easy the moment that we confess our faith and we believe in God and we get buried in baptism and come out it would be easy for God just to take us to heaven right then. That would be great. That would be lovely. That would be easy. He doesn't do that. And he doesn't do that for a very clear reason, right? He doesn't do that because we're still needed here on earth. We see Paul struggle with this idea his entire ministry, that he knows it would be easier for him to die in imprisonment, to die in shipwreck, to die in starvation, to die in any horrible way that's happening to him. But he knows, he confesses that he understands that God is keeping him alive for a reason. That God is keeping him alive so that he can preach Jesus to unbelievers. And that's the same exact reason that once we come out of the water in baptism, that God doesn't strike us dead and take us to heaven. He wants us to share that gospel message, that good news, with other people. Because that is what commitment's about. Commitment isn't just doing what's easy or what's convenient. Commitment is doing what's hard, being fully, 100% sacrificial, ready to devote yourself to something and someone bigger than yourself, God and his mission to save the lost. 
And I know. I know that's hard. There are times when it's easy. There are situations and circumstances where it feels it fell right into your lap. You have a friend who calls you and says, hey, I know you're a church-going fellow. I know that you know about God. Why don't you talk to me about him? Because I'm feeling like there's something spiritually missing in my life. That is an easy situation, but not all of them are like that. Most of them aren't like that. Most of them require commitment, require sacrifice, require uncomfortable conversations where feelings might get hurt, where toes might get stepped on, where people don't leave feeling super happy, yourself included. And yet that's why we're here. That's why we're here in this building today, because we don't want to just be involved. We don't just want to participate. We want to be fully and wholly committed. We want to save the lost. We want to play our part in the gospel narrative of salvation. It's important to note, and I know I've said this before, and I know Terry said this before, that God doesn't need us. Right? God does not need people, and yet... Not only did he choose to sacrifice himself, his son, on the cross for our sins, so we have an opportunity at salvation. He chose to enlist us, to partner with us in sharing that message with the rest of the world. He chose to give us a responsibility, a choice. Either you can or you can't. Either you will or you won't. Either you'll only serve in the ways that are easy and convenient or you will follow the gospel message to share and save the lost. And that's the idea I want to leave with you, with you tonight. The idea that as Christians, who I'm assuming we're all here because we want to be committed, we want to grow spiritually, we want to have that foundation in God's word, we un to understand what it means to live by his word. As Christians who want those things, who want to strive to be better, to be those things, we need to be ready for uncomfortable situations. We have to be ready to go out into the world and reach out to people who do not want to be reached out to, because those are the people who need it most. Like Apollos, our journey begins with knowing God's word, right? He was eloquent and knowledgeable in the scriptures. He came from a place of high esteem he was well-educated, and he knew God's word deeply. And like Apollos, we are called to believe that word in which we read. We are called to believe that Jesus died for our sins. We are called to confess his name among men, right? We're called to repent of our sins, turn away, live a life of humility, live a life according to the scriptures. And we're called to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, but not just for our own sake. So often, I think, we talk about baptism when we look at it as one-sided. And it's the important side we look at. We look at the side that is salvation, that it is necessary requirement of salvation. And we look at that, and we see that, and we only focus on that. And yet, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. There is beautiful symbolism in baptism, being buried in that water, coming out resurrected. Not only is it the way in which we receive our salvation, it is the way in which we receive the most beautiful and perfect and poetic way to share God's gospel message with the rest of the world. Yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I have failed. But there was someone who came before me, someone who was better, somebody who was perfect, Somebody who died, was buried, and resurrected. And in doing the same to myself, I have an opportunity to have everlasting life, and so do you. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you've not yet been baptized, if you've not yet had your sins forgiven, if you've not yet joined this family, and that is something that is important that you need to think about and consider and take the step towards right now. But if you're like myself, if you already have taken those steps, and yet so often you look at yourself in the mirror and you don't see full 100% commitment, you see somebody who participates. And if we're being honest, you probably participate pretty regularly. You do a lot. And yet if you're like me, you look in the mirror and you, you see 95%. You don't see 100 That's That's our goal, to sacrifice the self, to give up everything, 
in order to be a mirror of who God is. And if that's you tonight, and you need the prayers of the congregation, you need somebody to study with, read with, to pray with, to cry with, then that's an invitation for you as well. But mostly I want to send you home tonight with an easy and simple instruction. To tally it up. Are you giving 100%? 98, 95, 90, 80, 60? Where are you on the scale of commitment? And what do you need to sacrifice in order to get that number to 100? Because that's what we're called to do. If there's any way in which the church here can help you tonight, I encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing together. There's a fountain.